Um, hello. My name is Alyssa, and I am a hopeless romantic. Hello, Alyssa. It's gotten me into a lot of trouble. The running, the chasing, the mind games. And it always ends the same. I always get my hopes up just to get my heart broken. And I know it's silly to dream of someone waltzing into my life and sweeping me off my feet like I'm some sort of Disney princess, but man, wouldn't that be nice? Dating has always been really confusing for me. I'm never sure if someone likes me or like likes me or if they're just asking me for my number so they can copy my homework. The first crush I remember having was in first grade on a kid I'll call Coconut Head. Because his haircut kind of made his head look like a coconut. I I don't know, man. It was the early 2000s, and that's what I was into. He was smart, funny, always made sure I felt included on the playground. And one time, he shared his fruit snacks with me. He was everything a six-year-old girl could ask for. And on that fateful day when my pencil fell off my desk and he grabbed it, handed it back to me, looked me in the eyes and said, Here you go. Bam. I was in love. (laughs) I didn't know what to do about it. Like... What, am I supposed to ask him to ask his mom if uh, she can ask my mom if he can come over for a play date? And, and tell him to tell his mom that if she says no, I'm going to cry, so you should probably let him come over. No, I can't do that. Coconut Head was a man of chivalry, and I was merely a damsel in pencil distress. I could never air my feelings. I was shy. So what did I do? I bottled them up, stuffed them down real deep, and became very avoidant. <laughs> Keep in mind, I didn't even know if he liked me back. Picking up a pencil is a pretty neutral action when you think about it. Though, he did do it a couple times, and we sat together a lot, and talked a lot, and always picked each other to be partners. But what if he was just being friendly? I don't know. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. (laughs) Well, that settles that. Coconut head. Oh. Hi, Alyssa. Do you like me? (gasps) Uh, Huh? Well, you're always picking up my pencil and picking me to be your partner and sharing your fruit snacks, so do you like me? Oh my god. Uh, I, I, well... Tip number one. Talk to them. Alone, though. (laughs) Having a crush on someone is a very vulnerable thing. It's not easy to find the words to match the feelings, let alone say it all out loud. And the last thing you want to do to the kind soul who treats you right is embarrass them into never talking to you again. So don't do what I did. Also, Coconut Head, I am very sorry. The next crush I remember having was in middle school on a guy I'll call Finn. Like Finn from Adventure Time. I thought this guy was super cool. He dressed cool, he acted cool, he used curse words, he got in trouble all the time, he was mean to other kids, he was mean to teachers, he was in detention a lot. He probably wasn't the best person to have a crush on, but I guess that's why I had a crush on him. (laughs) Because I knew I didn't have to do anything about it. I knew he was bad news, I knew he'd never talk to someone like me, and I knew he didn't like me back. In fact, he didn't even know I existed. Nothing bad can happen if things don't happen in the first place. Who needs actual dates when you can just fall asleep fantasizing about them inviting you to the local roller skating rink? Why bother confessing feelings when you can vividly picture them catching you when you fall and holding your hand and sharing a big pizza pie? Yeah, that's amore. Which brings me to tip number two. Work towards having a healthy attachment style, whether you're crushing on someone or actually dating them. Now, attachment styles are just a theory. They develop during our first year of life, but they aren't set in stone from there on out. Our attachment styles can change for many reasons as we grow, from going through trauma or overwhelming experiences to actively working on improving ourselves. My point though is, I think attachment styles are worth referencing to check in on how you and others are operating in your close relationships whether that be with partners, friends, or even family. Secure attachment styles are relationships where you're confident they care about you, you're confident you care about them, and if something bad were to happen, you're confident you'd both be able to work through it without worrying that the other person would love you any less. Some less healthy types of attachment styles include anxious and avoidant. And although there are many, many more to learn about, 
I just want to focus on these two, since they often go hand in hand. As you could probably guess, I currently have avoidant attachment tendencies. Avoidants can be scared of getting close to people and scared of being vulnerable, for whatever personal reason. Maybe their trust was taken advantage of in the past. Maybe they did open up, only to be told their problems or feelings were stupid. Or maybe they don't know why their brain defaults to this thinking pattern, but they do know they're afraid of getting hurt. And they still get into relationships because we're only human. That's kind of what we do. But sometimes the avoidant ends up dating someone with an anxious attachment style. Anxious attachment style people are often scared that even though they and or their partner has opened up, they still don't feel secure in their relationship for whatever personal reason. Maybe they were with someone who made a lot of promises but never followed through. Maybe they knew someone for years, deeply, and were so securely attached. And out of nowhere, that person abandoned them. Or maybe they don't know why their brain defaults to this thinking pattern, but they do know they're afraid of getting hurt. And they still get into relationships because, again, we're only human. That's what we do. As most of you already know, the first person I dated was a regrettable one, to say the least. And if I didn't manage his emotions, he would take it out on me. It was stressful at its best and unsafe at its worst. If this dynamic sounds familiar to you, I have a bunch of videos and educational advice that I highly recommend checking out. Thankfully, those days are far behind me, and I'm doing a lot better, though I haven't really talked about my love life since then, because there's a lot of y'all listening now. A lot more than before. And the people I date deserve their privacy, as do I. But I will tell you this. Tip number three, treat every breakup like a lesson. If someone needs to leave, let them leave, no matter how much it hurts. There will be people you date who really change your life, but that doesn't mean you have to or will be with them forever. And those are the worst kinds of breakups because you love this person. They love you. And because you love each other so much, why would you hold each other back from being happy. You don't say, no, don't move hours away to pursue your dream. Stay here with me and settle. No, you love them, so you let them go. You don't say, okay, I'm unhappy in this relationship because we've grown into two amazing but completely different people over the years, but I guess I'll stay. No, you say, I'm sorry, we're no longer compatible, and we can't keep pretending we are just so we don't have to sleep alone at night. You don't say, yeah, you're right. Opposites do attract. Love makes you crazy. So even though this is harmful for both of us, mentally and emotionally, I guess I'll stay. No. You say, I'm so sorry I didn't have better boundaries and I was too afraid to go slow in this relationship for fear you would leave me. And now here we are three months in talking about marriage and we can't even get through one dinner without a stupid argument. We have to break up. And at times like these, we feel less like the knight in shining armor, less like the damsel in distress, and more like the twist villain that makes the other person say, wow, I should have known. So finally, after pining and romanticizing and falling and breaking and crying, you surrender to the universe or God or whatever omnipotent force is pulling all the strings you can't see. You stop forcing things, you stop meeting people, and you stop wishing for a relationship. Because at this point, it's as if you know too much. You know how these things start, you know how they go, and you know how they end, and you're just so sick of it. So you decisively, definitively stop looking for love. And of course, like we've all heard before, you'll find love right when you stop looking for it. So what happens then? What happens when one day you meet someone and no matter how much you try to escape fate, it feels like the sky is parting the clouds to make sure you don't miss this. And you think to yourself, all right, I'll take things slow. I'll be optimistic, but I won't get too invested. I won't get hurt again. What happens when the first time you hold hands, it feels like a movie? And before you know it, you're always together. Can't stand to be apart. You've got nicknames and mnemonics to remember their friends, their pets, their favorite places, what kind of car they can't wait to buy, how they got that scar on their leg, and why you both can't stand silence but you love doing nothing, especially together. What happens when 
you're no longer afraid to be vulnerable? What happens when they confess their feelings for you and you feel the same and you find yourself watching the sunset with them just like you've always dreamed? What happens when they finally kiss you and you realize you've never kissed someone as much as you've kissed them? What happens when you meet their parents, their friends, all the people in their life that they love and they're nice and you feel safe and you're sitting on the couch watching a movie together It's just a Tuesday night in some random, beautiful, small town you never knew existed until now. And they turn to you and say, I'm sorry, I don't see a future with you. What happens then? What do you do? You stand up, you put your shoes on, and you leave. And you want to cry, but you can't. Because you've been on the other end of those words before. You know how hard it is to break up with someone. You aren't mad. You don't want revenge. You don't want to be alone right now, but you also don't want to get back together. You don't really know what you want, other than to somehow be happy. And for them to be happy. Because you love them. And they love you. You go home. You unpack. And you make breakfast for the first time without them. You do some yoga. Shower. Go to work, see your friends, play a video game, check out that new restaurant, find a new song to listen to on repeat, anything, anything to fill the time and distract your mind and just live your life, just like you always have, just like you always did, before any of that happened, and you try not to think about the what-ifs. And this is for the best, whether you know it now or not. But you still have a lot of emotions left in you. A lot of closure you can only find on your own. So, what do you do? Well, you write a bunch of breakup songs, I guess. You got me imprinted Love's true human form Only found in sweaters that you've worn There's no going back Cloud nine is all I know I wanna throw your sweaters out Cause they don't feel like home 